Thanks for joining me. This episode is brought to you by our good friends at Oracle NetSuite. To turbocharge your growth, check out netsuite.com slash legends. Today, uh, I get to hang out with Upreneur superstar Chris Ducker. Uh, we have a fun, funny conversation. We talk about, of course, entrepreneurship, uh, fannies and fanny packs and why they're both funny, basketball, uh, watching questionable movies as a child, what books are great for entrepreneurs, and a whole lot more with the amazing Chris Ducker. All right, all right, all right. The Ramon said, hey ho, let's go, and that's exactly what we're going to do. Hello, my legendary friends. I'm so glad you joined me for this episode of Legends and Losers with the incredible uh, entrepreneur, youpreneur, thought leader, uh, motivator, insight deliverer, uh, par excellence, uh, Chris Ducker. And I uh, also want to let you know off the top that um, uh, Chris is a leader in a, in a whole area of teaching people how to niche down. <laughs> and uh, he's uh, quoted in, uh, in our new book as well as he was kind enough to give us a quote recommending our new book. And uh, if you have any thoughts about niche down that you want to share with us, um, why not send us an email to blackhole at legendsandlosers.com. And if you're one of the um, uh, many Legends and Losers listeners who purchased um, uh, Niche Down, I just again want to say thank you so much for making the book a uh, number one Amazon bestseller right out of the gate. Now, our founding sponsor is our good friends at NetSuite, and they want to provide you with a platform that enables to, you to manage your core business from a single, fully integrated system, while still giving you the flexibility to deal with the changing business environment, helping you save costs, manage, manage risks, and drive co productivity, and manage compliance. Don't you need to do that? One of the great things as your business grows is you get more and more potential compliance headaches. So NetSuite empowers you to get on top of this stuff, offering growing businesses a cloud management platform to give you real-time visibility and gain the financial perspective you need to drive innovation and profitable growth, all while helping you deal with the risks and regulations that could undermine your business. So the good folks at NetSuite are offering you, the Legends and Losers listener, uh, a private one-on-one -on -one, hour-long growth review with an expert in your industry see because NetSuite uh, has capabilities across many different industries and um, so go to netsuite.com slash legends and when you go there you'll be able to set up a time for your free uh, growth review with a NetSuite expert and don't forget NetSuite is surprisingly cost effective it's your one source of truth for revenue expenses customers orders and even HR check out netsuite.com slash legends all right my buddy Chris Ducker he's got a massively successful podcast called Upreneur he's the author of the bestsellers the rise of the Upreneur and virtual freedom how to work with virtual staff to buy more time, become more productive, and build your dream business. Uh, I got introduced to Chris by my good buddy, Kevin Miller. And Kevin is the host of another amazing podcast called The Ziggler Show or The Ziggler Podcast. Um, and uh, you know if you're a longtime listener to Legends and Losers that uh, Zig Ziggler, in uh, a very real way, taught me how to sell in the automobile university. So uh, having Kevin in my life, having Zig in my life is awesome, and I really appreciate him connecting uh, Chris and I. Uh, also, you can find Chris Ducker on Twitter, and if you uh, like what he has to say or just want to tell him you heard him here, or you got a question or some comment you want to make, you can find him at, on Twitter at Chris Ducker, D-U-C-K-E-R. And for more on Chris's incredible background, go to legendsandlosers.com and check out the show notes for this episode. And now, here he is, the Upreneur category king, Chris Ducker. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a dog ear page guy. I'm a highlighter guy. I'm a, you know, notes in the margins kind of guy. Yeah. I mean, that, that for me as well, like as an author myself, there is no greater compliment than when someone comes to an event or posts a photo up on Instagram or whatever, and it's a picture of your book and it is proper messed up. Like there's creases all over the cover and there's, you know, just yeah. crap all over the pages and there's coffee stains and the highlighters and pages have been half ripped and all that. I want my book to look just like 
that. That's exactly yeah. how I want it to look because it shows that it's actually been read and, and abused and used and passed around. Like from an author, that, that's all we could ever wish for, for anybody that's ever written a book, is for people to buy it and just totally mess it up. So I, I did want to ask you a little bit about your book. I, I'm sure this is true for you. Um, I seem to be running into more and more people who want to write a book. And mm. I forget who said this, so I, 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 I wish I could give credit. But somebody said, maybe even wrote a book called Everybody Should Write a Book. Um, and there's part of me that thinks everybody should write a book because it, it's a process that I um, you know, could never have imagined and, and is now something I could never have imagined not having gone through. And so all that said, um, you know, how do you think about writing? You wrote a very good book. I mean, it's a giant successful book and it's a, it's a book on a topic that a lot of people have written things about. You wrote a unique book that, that, that stands up. Well, it, it was, you know, when, when I, when I wrote my first book, when virtual freedom came out, I just wanted to get everything off my chest when it came to developing a system for bringing on board virtual staff to help you build and, and grow your business. Right. So first book comes out, flies off the shelves. We were probably only a couple of thousand copies away from getting a New York times bestseller. And I look at it now, four years later, we're at 400, uh, 850 five-star reviews on Amazon. It's ridiculous, right? And I was actually quite reluctant to follow that book up because I was genuinely like concerned inside of myself. Like, what if the second book isn't as popular? What if it doesn't become as much of a success as the first one was? And I think this is a lot. This is one really good reason why a lot of authors never write a second book is because they're scared that it won't do as well or better than their first one. And I was right in that category. Like I was genuinely concerned about it. But then when I started putting ideas together for Rise of the Upano, which is the second book, which came out at the beginning of this year, um, and that's the more what I more, read. I didn't read your first book. Well, that's okay. I still love you. You got we we, we go <laughs> to the same time. barber. We, <laughs> I, I could still we go to the it. same barber. We're like over. brothers. Don't worry about. It. Yeah, oh, no, I, look almost no, indistinguishable. I, I, <laughs> Although you're better looking than me. Well, thank you so much, sir. But I don't have cool guitars hanging on the wall behind me. I just want to clarify that. That's I hate, so but cool. now that you're moving back, you can set up your studio with whatever you want in it, right? I know. I know exactly. So yeah, when the second book came with out, a Union Jack on it. <laughs> Don't you think, I mean, don't you think that's just a tad, just crap? I mean, <laughs> a little too, way too cliche. Just a tad. I'm thinking just a little bit, just yeah. a little bit. I don't know. But, 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 you know, but you say that. You own it. <laughs> see, if I, well, there you go. You right? see now like, I, like, like, I think a mullet is really not what you want to do, but no. every once in a while you see someone and you kind of go, they really own, they're owning the fuck out of that mullet. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't look all that half bad. You're absolutely right. I get it. You have a moment where you go, like, I'll give you an example. The 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 fanny pack is coming back around here. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's popular in the Philippines. I I have such a great story about that word. Please let me tell it. But I want to know what you was going to say about the fanny pack first. Go. Well, and I get the utility of them. It makes all the sense in the world. <laughs> like men, if, if, if we could have a man purse. Okay you know, yeah. that we could kind of get away with, then that would be great. But yeah. I just can't get over that it makes you look like a total dork. So I'm not wearing one of these things. Right, right. Oh, I'm with you. Okay. Yeah. So, so let, tell me so, about fanny packs. His, well, it's not actual <laughs> fanny packs. It's just the, the fanny thing. So in, so in the UK, yeah, uh, you may or may not. Word. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, yeah, you may or might, may not be aware, uh, be aware of this, and some of your listeners might not be either. So I'll explain. Um, the word fanny in the UK means something completely different to your butt. Um, it's, and I'm a gentleman, so I'll, I'll put it like this. It's, in, it, it's to do with the female nether region's private parts, put it that way. That's what we, that's, that's a fanny is is that's that and so <laughs> so i'm and, about and, and just to interrupt you now is, is it considered a rude word if we say this at dinner like oh jessica um, has a nice fanny or 
<laughs> God. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I mean, it's not, I, I don't think the word, on a very serious note, I don't think the word is seen as a, like a crude word or a disrespectful word. Um, you know, there are certainly other words in the English language that, will, that would fall into those, that category. But no, I mean, it, it's not necessarily, I wouldn't say it at dinner, put it that way. I don't think yeah. I would bring it up at dinner. You might, but I, I, I certainly wouldn't. But anyway, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm about, oh, it's a great word. I'm 18 years old and I'm in California. I'm in San Francisco. No, I'm not 18, I'm 19, 1920, whatever the hell it is. And um, I'm in California and I go to um, the university there where the basketball team is the Bears. Is that, I don't know what university it that's, is. That's the Cal Bears, the university. Okay, there you uh, go. Yeah, it's in, it's in, it's, it's in Berserkly. Okay, yeah. So, I, so I'm staying with friends and I'm one of their friends or siblings or whatever, I can't remember now, it was eons ago, um, is going there. So we go there and we had the best pizza of my life on that campus. It was a, a Blondie's Pizza place i remember the name of the store uh, the name of the pizzeria it's fantastic i don't know whether they're still still there or not but anyway um so i'm a ball player i'm a basketball player i'm one of the rare brits that you'll meet that hates football or soccer as you guys call it um yeah, i despise it i think it's one of the most boring games on the planet why watch like 90 minutes with a 30 minute break in the middle of people running up and down this ridiculously huge pitch for like maybe two scoring moments in a game, like on average, right? I'm a, I'm a guy. Watch hockey. If you want to watch that, watch hockey way better. It's like soccer, but a thousand times better. Right. But not, but I'm a basketball guy. So I'm a, I'm a huge. You though. So you, you, what'd you think of the, the playoffs this year, the finals? It was okay. So it was both, it was bittersweet for me. Because I'm a Celtics guy. And so, and I've been a Celtics guy since I was 12 years old, since I discovered the game. And so, um, I was upset that we didn't make the finals. I genuinely feel like we should have made the finals. I, even, even without our star, like we, we just should have made the finals. Just should have done it, plain and simple. But that's the bitter part. The sweet part is just seeing the Cavs just getting their ass handed to them game after game after game. Like I just, I'm not a LeBron fan and uh, just to see, <laughs> just to see them get swept like that in the finals. I thought it was great, but I, I'll give respect. I will always give respect where respect is due. He played incredibly well throughout that entire postseason. Incredibly well. Uh, but, I think, uh, he, look, I'm he didn't have the support, you know, I'm no expert on basketball, so I, I probably don't deserve to have an opinion. But I, I kind of thought he was the MVP, with, and I thought Durant was amazing. But like he had some of the best games ever in the finals. Yeah, they still lost, right? Yep. Yep. Um, but that's why it's a team game. You know, it's a team game. That's the whole thing. And so, yeah, I, I, I was kind of I was kind of upset about the whole Celtics getting knocked out. But we'll we'll be back next year. We'll have a strong chance next year. It'll be good. But uh, Warriors Celtics next year. I'd love that. I think it would be great. I think I'll that would be you, a great finals next year. I've lived in the broader Bay Area now for 22, 23 years, something like that. This is a very easy place to love team sports. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's incredible. I mean, since I've been here, all the teams have done incredibly well. I mean, the Sharks made it to the playoffs and lost, but uh, – and I can remember going to Warriors games, you know, years ago, and they just, they were like a, a minor league team in the NBA. Uh, <laughs> right. It was, it was, un you, you absolutely went to see the other teams. And, uh, and now, man, wow, it's been crazy great. Yeah. So it's just, it's an exciting game, you know, just watching. And I've seen NBA games all over the U.S. Well, I've been there for speaking engagements and traveled and, holidays and all that kind of stuff my wife is also a big hoops fan as well um and uh we love it i mean we've seen games everywhere and so we just we, we yeah it's great it's a great game it's a fantastic game so let me get back to my fanny story because it's a good yes, one I, we, we're gonna we digress yes. we went down one of those rabbit holes that you were talking about earlier so so i'm at this uh this this university's campus 
and um, I'm, a, I'm a ball player. And the guy's like, well, you know, the, the team, or I think it was the second team or whatever it was, uh, has scrimmaged today. Do you want to run? And I'm like, well, I don't have a pair of shoes. Well, we, you know, you can, we can find a pair of shoes and we'll, you know, we can run. Great. Yeah, I'll run. Let's go. So we went down to the court, got changed, and uh, I'm scrimmaging with the team and I'm loving it. This is great. Now, I, I actually represented my country as an under 21. So like I got some game back in the day. I had a little game, Chris. And so I'm holding my own and I'm running around and I'm playing D and I'm, you know, doing all the things that you need to do as a foreigner to sort of try and fit in. Um, and, uh, and this guy starts, this, one of these players starts backing into me and I'm on D and I'm pressing up against him and I'm trying to like play strong and everything. And my, you know, we're, we're kind of pushing and shoving a little bit. My hand <laughs> kind of touches his butt, right? And so he turns around in the middle of this scrimmage. He said, hey, man, get your hand off my fanny. And for me, at that moment in time, it was the most hilarious thing that I've ever heard a man say ever in my life. And I just burst out into laughter. I couldn't control. I thought it was absolutely hilarious. And then the, the whole thing kind of just fell apart and stopped. And I had to tell them all why I thought it was so bloody hilarious. And then they all started laughing. And then for the rest of the day, we were hanging out with maybe six or seven other players. For the rest of the day, they just, cut, they, they, they just kept using the word fanny. And it was just, I mean, it was hilarious. It's like, it's like when I teach one of my American friends any Cockney rhyming slang, like London rhyming slang. I got like a friend of mine, Vinny. Uh, and, and he's an American Italian dude. And he's, you know, I, I like to go into De Niro with you now when we're hanging out with him and he goes into like full blown Cockney, you know what I mean? And he's, he's just, he's hilarious. He uses, he uses the rhyming slang at completely the wrong time. And it's some of the most hilarious bourbon sessions I've ever had in my life is hanging out with Vinny. I love it. Well, and of course, when you have that going on and you're that guy, you have no idea really how funny you're being or not funny because you've got no context right <laughs> exactly you and that's what makes it so damn so good you just keep doing whatever the thing is but you really right. have no clue he's hilarious and oh he's just and he but but what i love about him is that i get random texts from him every now and then as well and it's just <laughs> just get, it's some of the most ridiculous stuff that i've, I've ever i've ever seen or heard in via text it's great i love it but yeah so we hang out we do bourbon and we do de niro and we uh we have a lot of fun it's 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 good fun <laughs> yes uh, de niro's been on uh saturday night live a lot lately he's been playing uh um investigator muller so good i haven't seen any of the clips special counsel muller whatever his okay. title is okay but uh yeah de niro's been funny uh he does comedy really well really well. like I, I, don't, I don't think he gets as the, the respect that he should have as a comedic actor you know walker's stuff is so fucking funny oh my god um i will take you down i will take you down to chinatown are you serious like did you just stuff. say that yeah. and it's you know what you know what that's that scene in that first movie is the close proximity <laughs> that he has with stiller with that character and he's sort of he's, he's got the marijuana pipe in his hand and he's just the way that he's delivering those lines are just it's great i love and de niro one he's of the greatest lines in history is <laughs> are you a pothead fucker <laughs> I mean, I, so good. Me myself. Yeah, so good. Just brilliant. And, and, and no one could have played that role better than him. No one. No one at all. But when we think of De Niro, we think back to like, you know, I mean, if you're a hardcore fan like me, you go all the way back to like Raging Bull and obviously The Godfather and all that kind of stuff. But most people think of De Niro and they think of Goodfellas and Casino and those kind of movies. And yeah, they're I, great. I go to Ra yeah. The first place I go to is Raging Bull. And yeah. then, you know, the other one that sticks in my mind, um, do you remember he was in the remake uh, years ago now of Cape Fear? Oh, yes. Yes. And Great. I, 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 I will admit it. I'm man enough to admit it. I don't think I could sit through that movie today. Why? He's, ter he's terrifying in that movie. Yeah, he's pretty First scary. Of, right? He's ripped as shit. Uh, yeah. The opening scene is a scene of him doing... Um, uh, pull-ups pull or push-ups or something, right? Something yeah. like that. And yeah. he's cut and he's got this gnarly tattoo and he's in insane shape. <clears throat> anyway, yeah. 
Yeah, he's ter- and he, and the other thing too is, you know, I wonder if they'd even make a movie like that today because he haunts um, a I I think she's a teenager. Yeah, um, Juliet Lewis. Yeah, and I, I think she's supposed. To, I don't know. I don't remember. It's been a long time, but I think she's supposed to be like I don't know, sixteen or eighteen or you know, a, a young woman, and and it gets very creepy and gnarly. Right. But it's one of those uh, Hitchcockian style pot. Yes. Right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Great movie. And the accent, you know, and, and just the, the fashions. He's got the big stogie with him all the time. You know, it's just it's a that's yeah, pretty scary movie. Right. I haven't seen it for a long, long time. You know, I'm going to Netflix the hell out of that, that thing. Uh, yeah, I don't think time. I could sit through it. It's like. um <laughs> this was a few years ago but I, I for whatever reason decided to fire the shining back up again now that's one scary movie that's a scary film you know i can handle scary what i didn't remember is it's 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 terrifyingly misogynistic and right. like abusive to his wife and he's terrorizing his wife and it's just I, I couldn't watch it. Well, you know, I, I, I remember reading a really in-depth blog post on that movie a few years back. Um, and Kubrick, the director of the movie, he put that actress through complete and utter hell through the course of that shoot. He would isolate her. He wouldn't let her eat. He would swear and curse and shout at her all the time because he wanted her to be genuinely disheveled and scared, crapless, plain and simple. And and the scene, this was what surprised me the most when I was reading it, the scene where he's chasing her up the stairs and she's swinging the baseball bat at him just at the beginning of kind of the big finale. They shot that, that scene like a hundred times and she had to cry throughout the entire scene i mean like he yeah, no. yeah he he ruined that woman apparently <laughs> over the course of that shoot he was absolutely yeah, horrible it, to her it, it's it's terrifying and yeah it's not i mean i watched it as a kid you know teenager yeah me too I, I probably saw yeah. it more than once but uh when i tried to watch it as an adult you know married man i just i just i just couldn't get through you know very much of it yeah yeah yeah, I, yeah. another movie i watched as a kid growing up over and over again was the evil dead. I remember that one. That was kind of I like that movie. the quintessential low budget horror movie that everybody wanted to see, but in the UK it was banned. And so, you know, we, got, I remember oh, getting like yeah, a dodgy VHS. Awesome. Yeah. we got like a dodgy VHS copy of it and uh, kind of, you know, had to sneak it into my friends. My friend lived, uh, my friend lived above a pub. His mom and dad were running the pub. And uh, I remember watching it on a Sunday afternoon when they were at, the pub was full, and me and my friend Steve, we we went up to his living room above Steve, the pub. You and, and Steve, <laughs> me and my mum, my boy Steve, and we went up to uh, the living room above the pub and watched it. And we, I think we we're maybe oh, like yeah. maybe twelve years old. I think, and yeah, uh, get the crap so out of me. That I don't <laughs> think so, Mister Tucker. I don't think that happens very often today. I don't think. I think most parents today. I don't know, at least the parents I know are generally pretty good at protecting their yes. eight to 12, right? So it sounds like you have had some of these same experiences. Did you have adults in your life that, that let you watch this shit? Um, I, don't, I, I don't, I don't know where, I mean, I don't think they let me watch it, but I don't, I mean, a lot of time, you know, like, we would, like, I would do that stuff like around my friends' houses. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I, 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 I don't know. Yeah, well, I mean, look, I had a my uncle John. Uh, he, he's my crazy uncle, and by the way, I say that with tremendous love. And uh, most of the kids in my life call me their crazy uncle. So there you have it's a it. compliment. It's a compliment. Yes. Yeah. So my crazy uncle John loved horror movies, and I loved horror movies. But as a as a as a kid, he he let me watch some very gnarly shit. I mean. <laughs> you know, 10 years old, Amityville horror and like all these, you know, like movies with like, there was one movie, what the hell? It, 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 this guy's a scientist, doctor type guy, his girlfriend's in a car accident, her body's decimated and he somehow figures out how to keep her head alive. 
So he's got her head in the laboratory and she talks to him and she's real bitchy. And he's also a Frankenstein like dude. So he tried to create human life, but it didn't work out. So there's literally a monster that lives in the closet and the girlfriend head. Oh, and it can't talk. It just kind of grunts and makes noises and thrashes around in the closet. And the girlfriend head talks to the monster. Anyway, anyway, the whole thing ends horribly and everybody dies and, but there's a moral to it at the end. I could tell you if you cared, but the net of it is I saw that when I was like six. Oh God! It scared the <laughs> shit out of me. Right. I, I right. think I was 13 or 12 when I saw the exorcist, like the full on exorcist. Yeah. yeah so yeah. that, that shit, that shit will get you early. Did, totally. did you have all that too? I think, well, yeah, we totally. Yeah, absolutely. I remember watching the omen. I remember the oh, omen. Yeah. The omen. Good God, that music still scares the crap out of me now. And I, I like, I remember, I remember actually watching that on VHS with my mum, and several times, you know, throughout the course of the movie. That's my, good you parenting, right there, well, isn't it, Chris? Well, she, well, she turns around, and she says, "You shouldn't be watching this." Well, send me to bed or something then. Why are you, why are you letting me continually watch <laughs> the thing and give me nightmares for a bloody month? You know what I mean? So no, I, yeah. I, uh, I, I think my mum and dad are actually pretty cool. Like. Like when I was 12, 13, like I discovered Bruce Lee and here I am literally sitting there with a Bruce Lee t-shirt on right now. I discovered Bruce when I was like 12, 13 and fell in love with him. And I, like, I, I remember buying like a secondhand copy of Enter the Dragon on VHS in the summer holidays. And I watched that thing so many times in that summer holiday break that I ruined the tape. I mean, we, I just, there was no film left on it. I mean, I must've watched it three times a day, literally almost daily. And, and, and so I can still recite like full blown passages from that movie right now. It's ridiculous. They're in, they're ingrained in my skull. Um, and, and so when they, when they realized I was kind of like in the Bruce, you know, my dad, I think it was my birthday coming up. My dad bought me a couple of his other movies on VHS. And then, you know, we'd finished the collection at, 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 uh, at Christmas time. And, you know, they were cool for me watching all this stuff. And then I started studying martial arts and, you know, that my dad bought me my first pair of nunchaku, you know what I mean? And, and so they were cool with all that kind of stuff. Um, but my mom was very, uh, she was, she was very Catholic Irish, my mom, very, very Catholic Irish. So, you know, if, if you, uh, you know, we would never even consider any sexy movies or anything like that. Like there was, there was no room for that stuff. And in violence, fine. Sexy, not so much. Violence is okay. Psychological, uh, horror movies are absolutely okay but if you bring any sort of remote we would call it in the uk back in those days blue movies if you would yes. <laughs> if yes, you would I if, know if, that if, term yeah well, i know my family's so, originally from scotland so i got there you go. blue movies there you go so yeah you bring any blue movies into the house your mom's gonna mess you up and so uh yeah there you go now, did you see um speaking of blue movies did was rocky horror picture show big for you guys Huge, dude. That was yeah, massive. That's what I thought. And and so and how actually, old were you when you saw that, oh god, I think I'm gonna say I was about fourteen, probably yeah. when I saw that. Fourteen, right. fifteen, and actually, yes. I was a drama student, and we actually performed that or, or scenes of that movie as part of our annual kind of. Which character thing. were you? Um, I was, I can't even remember the, his name. I was the ball guy. I was, was it Riff Raff? Riff Is that Raff. the name? Yeah. Riff Raff. There you go. Yeah. I was, I was that, I was that guy. Even back in those days when I had hair, I was being cast as somebody who had no hair. So yeah, figure that out. It was yeah. foreshadowing. And, 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 Riff Raff's um, a great character. <clears throat> what was the name of the songs. song? Um, yeah, I'm trying to think there's one big song time warp, that, time warp. Well, there's the time warp for sure is the big song in the movie, but he also does a solo song. If I remember. Yeah, I can't remember. It was so many years ago now. And it was so many so years. Fucking, I, that movie is so fucking great. And here's the weirdest thing. Um, did, I assume you saw, you saw it in a theater. No. We saw it. I, I think we got it. I think, I know, I definitely didn't see that in the... Oh, I mean, wow. when you say... When, okay, so when you, when you say theater, you're talking about play theater or movie, no, movie theater? theater? Okay, no. I didn't see it in the movie theater. Not at that point. I did see it in the movies, uh, actually, probably when I was about 17, 18, because where I grew up in Wimbledon, we had the, the big Odeon cinema there, and that was where I saw all my movies. Like, I distinctly remember Empire Strikes Back uh, in that theater. I remember 
leaving the theater and crying my eyes out because Darth Vader was Luke Skywalker's father. I re- that affected me horrifically. <laughs> I, I, re- I, I remember, um, I remember queuing around the building in a full 360 to go see Rocky four in that theater. Um, which I thought was probably one of the greatest films to ever see in the cinema at, which, at which, those which days. Which one is that one? <laughs> Rocky IV, the one where he beats the Russian the at Russian, the end, the big Russian, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> I remember, you know, it's London after all. And um, I remember just as he comes back and he starts, you know the part in the movie where he kind of he crosses into Drago's face and a little bit of blood and the commentator says, he's cut, the Russian's cut, and it's a bad cut. He woke the sleeping giant and blah, blah, blah. Some of the best boxing commentary ever. And I remember some random dude in the theater stands up at the back of the theater and he shouts out at the top of his lungs, come on, Rocky, knock the shit out of the commie bastards. And I'm like, yeah, you really are watching a film in London. <laughs> it was so good. But yeah, so I remember, I remember seeing Rocky Horror Show at, at that theater because they played it as a midnight screening right. every Friday night. Okay, now for that's what we're talking years about. And, and, years and people and got years. up and acted out the, the movie in front and of them. And they came dressed up. They yes. came dressed up, okay, you know? Good. Yeah, yeah. See, that's the thing. experience that we all had. Yes. And uh, somebody tried to you know, sit down and watch it with me. <clears> and I, I, it occurred to me, I've never seen it. I've only seen it in a theater with a whole bunch of people on stage mirroring the movie in right. the movie theater. I've never actually seen the movie without all the people throwing rice and toast and all right, that. right, yeah. right, right, right. Yeah, a great movie, great oh, stuff. Listen, this is, I mean, this was this is this is a cool conversation right here. I mean, all we've done is really just talk about films. I'm down with this. I mean, well, there there well, are plenty of legends and losers in the film industry. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and some of them boomerang back and down and around again. <laughs> they do. You know, you talk about like Michael Keaton earlier on. You talk about boomerang, boomeranging, you know, up and down, like the Batman stuff, you know, uh, even further Beetle back Juice. than that. Beetlejuice, Batman. oh my God, so good. So good. And then he kind of just disappeared. And then he came back and I saw him recently in um, The Founder. The story of Ray. Oh yeah, I haven't Kroc seen that yet. Is and and good? and the McDonald's story, absolutely fantastic. And I actually read the book "Grinding It Out" by Ray Kroc many years ago. Great book. You must get this book. It's a great book. Um, and I remember picking that book up actually in like a secondhand bookstore for like a pound or something in uh, Petticoat Lane in London. Um, and brilliant, brilliant book. But then when, the, when I was actually on a flight over to the United States last year. And uh, I, I I saw it, you know, in 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 the um, in the entertainment system, and I watched it, and I thoroughly, thoroughly loved it. He did such a great job in that film. He, I love Michael Keaton; he's great. He's a good actor. Yeah, he's. And he just disappeared for a while, you know. I love that. I'm bad, man. Now yeah. I gotta, you know, and I know I don't have you for very much longer. So you, you made me think about something as you were talking. Um, <laughs> That's good. Books, yeah, books. Yeah. You you are the Youpreneur guy. You wrote the Youpreneur book. You you've had a zillion of successful people in this world um, on your podcast. You've read everything there is to read because you have a lot of you know you. So, what are the I don't know, you tell me three to five books that every Youpreneur, other than yours, which of course is number one. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, you know, people always say, "What business books do you recommend?" Well, I recommend "Play Bigger," "How Pirates, Dreamers, and Innovators." You know, what, what do you think I'm going to recommend? I know, right? I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I can come up with like three or four books that I've really enjoyed and have made me think about things, not just from a business perspective, but just you know, lifestyle and all that kind of stuff. So, I mean, I think the one book that really probably made a lot of difference to me and what I do today as a business owner was Crush It by Gary Vee. When that first came out in probably, I think I read that in like very late 2009, I read the entire book in one sitting. Um, And what I really picked up from that book was people want to hear from you as the business owner. So, you know, he talks about like doing video, you know, getting active on social, all the stuff that we kind of take for granted now. But back in 2009, you know, as a business owner, I'd been, I'd already been running my business five years. We were already well over, well into the million dollar 
you know, plus plus revenue on an annual basis. But then I started doing YouTube and I started blogging and I started podcasting in 2010 and it kind of all just blew up at that point. And then the personal brand for me developed, then the speaking gigs come along and then the book deal comes along and so on and so on and so on. And so that book really was the catalyst, I think, for me to kind of get very active with new media. So crush it. Gary V. And I've told Gary this. We've hung out on a number of occasions. We're not best friends or anything, but you know, we, we respect each other and, and we've hung out and all that stuff. And I've told him outright, I mean, like your book really was a pretty big catalyst for me uh, in regards to taking the business up to the next level. So lots of props for Gary and Crush It. Um, I have, and, and I will also be very frank and honest, I've not really got all that much from any of his other books. And I've read them all. Um, I've well, genuinely, I, nothing is, nothing has made a difference to me in any way whatsoever more than crush it. And I don't want to be a bummer. Um, and I get you guys are buddies and stuff. I'm not a fan of his at all. Um, because of what he's become. Um, okay. I, I think it's a real bummer. Um, well, he's certainly, he's, I, I don't watch his stuff anymore. Like the last couple of years, I've not looked at any of his stuff at all, really. Um, and it's not because I've started to dislike his rhetoric or anything like that, but he's, he's, going, he's going in a different, dire- like a different direction to what he was back in 2009, 10, 11, 12. He's, he's, he he kind of wants to be like the millennial Tony Robbins. I think that's kind of the, the direction he's kind of going in. And I don't care. And I swear, just like anybody else from time to time, but I don't care for all of the swearing and the marketing and all that stuff as well. Particularly like when you're, when you're on stage and you're answering a question from you know, a nine or a 10-year-old you know, aspiring YouTuber and you're dropping the F-bomb in your answer, there's no need for that. Like I'm a dad. Like there's, you know, that's kind of where my, my daddy bear instincts come into play. Like a, there's just no need for a lot of that stuff. So there you go. Yeah, and I, I think... I th- I have no idea what he was like before in the beginning, but it, he seemed very different. I, I look, this is probably too harsh, but it's how I feel. I think he's a business Kardashian now. Mm-hmm. Like it just seems the shit that he puts out is just look at me, look at me, look at me, and, and it's just I don't know. It, it it's it's just I think he's a giant bummer, and I think a lot of his advice now is just really pablomatic. You know, hustle. Well, he's hustle, he's which, he's repeating him. He's repeating himself quite a bit. I think it's a bummer. I don't think it's it's. It, you know what, my friend Eric Weinmeyer, and this was not in the context of 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 him, so I don't want to uh, misconstrue it to quote Archie Archie Bunker, but he calls stuff that I interpret like that to be candy. It's just it's not substantive, mm-hmm. and I think we're. I don't know. I just don't need to see a guy like. I'm with you. Yeah. Anyway, I'm what are you. the other books? Yeah. Uh, so crush it. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed the Ray Charles autobiography, Brother Ray. That was a great book. I'm a big Ray fan. I used to be the lead singer in a soul and blues band back in the day. So uh, I got a lot of Brother Ray in me, man. A lot of Brother Ray in me. So that was a great book. Um, what else have I read? Uh, Losing My Virginity. Richard Branson, probably yeah, one of the best. Come on one of the best autobiography type business books you can grab a hold of. Um, another really good one. A lot of people don't haven't heard of this one, but it's a book called content Inc by my very good friend, um, Joe Polizzi from over at uh, content marketing world, content marketing Institute sold the business last year, but he's still a little involved with it. But Joe is the, he's, he's, the God of content marketing. I mean, he's known as the Godfather of content marketing. He is incredible. And that book, if you wanted to get one book on how to be a great content marketer, content Inc would be that book. It's that That's good. great. I had not heard that. I, it sounds like a book I probably need to get in my hands. It's a great book, man. And it's a chunky little one as well. Like you'll put it on your shelf and you pick it up every quarter to get another idea or two. Like it's a really, it's a great book. Um, what other books? Oh, you know, there was another book. And, I've, I, and, and in all honesty, I've never read this entire book from front to back. But it was a book uh, by the name of a lady uh, under the name of Daniel Laporte named Firestarters. That was the name of the book, Firestarter. And uh, I've never read the book cover to cover. It was gifted to me 
by by a friend, but I have dug into it here and there. Um, and it's really just all about kind of, you know, obviously lighting your own fuse and being a, a, a self-starter and all that kind of stuff. But it's a really good book. And actually, it's a nice book to kind of see, feel, and touch and, and look through it. It's a nicely designed book as well. So that's another good one. Um, and I will say, at the risk of maybe being a little bit controversial here, which I know that you have no problems as we wrap up this interview with me being, um, The Art of the Deal by Donald Trump is, I've got to say, as a sales guy who's been in the sales industry since his late teens, probably one of the best books I've read on the subject of preparing for negotiations and putting deals together and just selling and just thinking big and all that kind of stuff that Trump is known for. Now, I'm not a fan of Donald Trump. I think he's a bloody doofus, quite frankly. But I didn't read that book last year or the year before that. I read that book probably 12, 13 years ago when it first came out. And it for me, as a guy in the sales industry, it helped me think bigger than what I was thinking. Uh, and and, and all, honestly, like the way that he prepared for his meetings and his negotiate, like months of preparations for 30 minute meeting, you know, like that you have to, re- back in the day, I would respect him because of that kind of uh, no, focus I, I on his craft. The book. There, I, I, I did a bunch of sales training programs early in my career. Um, I went to the Zig Ziglar, you know, university. I love Zig. Car. Oh, we could do an hour on Zig alone. Easy. Yeah, right. Uh, he was, he was like, felt like my uncle. Yeah. Uh, Cause you know, but we didn't, there was no podcast back in the, in the eighties and nineties anyway. Um, and so, and I did, I did, have you heard of the Karis training, the Karis negotiating training, a lot of purchasing no. agents and people in purchasing tend to tend to, do this training and there's a book and stuff. So I started after I did a bunch of sales training, I thought, well, I need to get some negotiating training, you know, the kind of training that typically the person on the other side of the table would be getting versus kind of sales training. And so, um, yeah, I remember doing that stuff and I remember reading Art of the Deal. I I don't remember much about it, um, but I'm also somebody who, whatever my opinion of him may or may not be, I, I, I can separate that stuff, you know, um, I'm so with I you. actually don't find that all that controversial. <laughs> no, I hear you. And I mean, it was, it was very helpful. I mean, it was, it was, it's a good book. I, I think the guy's an idiot now, but it was a good book. Yeah. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be open-minded and I'm trying to be hopeful. Well, I think as an American, you have to be, <laughs> let's not go the political route here, yeah, no, we, but, we, um, we, I think, I think you've got to, be. I think even as a Brit, I have to be as well. You know, um, I think that, uh, man, I mean, let's just see what happens with this whole. And I also think, you know, this is something that we don't have in this country. Um, if you like them and you're rooting for them, great. Uh, and I have friends who do, and that's how they feel. Um, I, I'm a registered independent, so I'm ne- neither. I don't have a horse in the race in that sense. Mm-hmm. So I have my opinions about them like anybody. But. Uh, regardless of my opinion about them, I think the other thing we don't have enough of in the United States, and I say this as a person who became a citizen, um, you still got to root for them. You have to. You're absolutely right. You do. Right. Even yeah. if you want him impeached and you, and you hope that he gets impeached, which, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. Who knows what's going to happen, right? So, But even if you're in that place, you still have to hope that, before he gets impeached, and I'm not saying he's getting impeached, by the way. I'm just saying if you're, if you're that negative on him, don't you still have to hope that, that like, it, he does good things until then? Absolutely. It's the country, yeah. right? So, yeah. like, I don't know. I, that, that part I, I don't get. But anyways, I digress. <laughs> no, I hear you. But, I, you know, I mean, that's just the – you know, the reality of life is that you don't always get what you want, right? But it, I think that as long as you take care of your side of, of the world, like if, if you, you know, if you're a good person, you do good things and you, you help 
the people that you come into contact with and, and, you know, you feel good about what you do day to day, then you're living, you're living the best life you can. I mean, it, you know, you can't control Trump or any other outside force. I mean, his own people can't control him. So what makes you think that you're going to be able to, I mean, you know, it, it kind of, it is what it is. My whole deal is like somebody asked me recently, what do you want your legacy to be? And it's such a huge, ridiculously massive word. And I said, I'm going to answer that with two answers. The first thing is that I want my kids to do better than what I've done. And I've done pretty good. That would be a pretty good legacy to leave behind. And secondly, anybody that's ever come into contact with me, I want them to tell me, I want them to say that I was a nice guy. So if I can do that, and I understand that. I'm not going to please all the people all the time, but if my kids can do great, and if people feel like I've been a nice guy to them, that's a pretty good legacy, I reckon. Yeah, that's great. It's funny, the motivations of different people. Uh, this may make me sound crazy. I don't have a motivation to be thought of as a nice guy. <laughs> no, that's cool. Well, I mean, your show is not want to be Legends nice and guy. Losers. I mean, <laughs> I want to be nice, and I tr go out of my way to be nice to people. Of, of course, but that's not, it's not necessarily, uh, <laughs> no, I look yeah, totally. You know we, we've all got, yeah, we've all got, we've all got different motivations. No, but as you're saying it, I'm different. thinking, wow, something's wrong with me. Cause that's not actually <laughs> necessarily how I would, you know, right. listen, there's a lot of people who don't think I'm a nice guy at all. I like, I have made real, <laughs> no bullshit enemies in business for sure. I mean, absolute right. enemies. Well, I'm I'm sure that I'm sure there's plenty of people that think I'm a complete jerk off as well. But at the end of the day, I can live with it because I know I'm taking care of my business my own way, and and I'm doing it as right as I possibly can. You know. Yeah. Well, uh, Mr. Ducker, this has been fantastic. It was. Um, uh, Wish I had more time, man. I I, I would love to a mystery tour or a box full of chocolates or. <laughs> I, I would I, I would I would love to have had more time with you, man. It was a great conversation. I thoroughly and, and you know, enjoyed it. The other it. thing too, I, I think is fun is, uh, and I, I I sort of did this, I guess, a little bit on purpose. Um, you know, you're a guy who spends a lot of time talking about your area of expertise, as you should, and I, you know, I am too. And so I don't know. The, the more we kept going in the conversation, the more I thought, let's just talk about other shit. <laughs> totally. <laughs> I agree with you 100%. Like, like we're literally sitting down having a beer. I just, I don't know. I didn't, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe it was something in the way the Verve coffee was roasted this morning or something. I just, somehow it seemed to have, have, be more fun to have a less businessy conversation and just. I, know, and, uh, and I will say, you, you know, that, that's a, a breath of fresh air, uh, you know, for, I'm very blessed to get invited to come on to a lot of different shows. And um, I almost always, say yes, if my schedule would permit, particularly with friends like yourself. And so it's like, you know, I, uh, I love talking about personal brand business and how to, you know, make money off of your expertise and help people in the process. But at the end of the day, I also love talking about, you know, Bruce Lee and men in fishnet stockings. So, you know, let's rock it out. <laughs> 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 All right, Chris, thank you so much. It's been an absolute joy, and uh, I look forward to chatting with you soon, brother, and stay legendary. You know it, man. Take good care. Whew. That was a fun one, wasn't it? <laughs> uh, just a blast hanging out with the uh, legendary Chris Ducker. And uh, if you know somebody in your life who would love this episode, why not share it with them right now if you're listening on your smartphone or your tablet or whatever it is you're listening on. And uh, we would love you just a little bit extra if you shared the show on social media. When you share the show, when you review the show, it makes a huge difference to us. And it lets us uh, get the word out to others about Legends and Losers. And I don't know about you. There's nothing more powerful than when a friend says, hey, man. I love this podcast. You need to check it out. And so if you love Legends and Losers, we would love you a little bit extra if you would do that. And I'd also encourage you to check out our new spinoff of Legends and Losers. It's doing incredibly well. It's called Six Minutes of Legendary. And it's unlike anything that you've ever heard because we take incredible clips from the podcast and we set them to music and we create these tracks. 
And um, Six Minutes of Legendary is, is the brainchild of myself, but more importantly, Nick Cullen. He's an incredible uh, innovator in the digital world. He's a musician. He's a growth hacker. And um, Six Minutes of Legendary has come out of the shoot. It's been a top 200 podcast. It's made it as high as, I think, number five. So check out Six Minutes of Legendary. All right. We would like to thank ChrisDucker.com. That's the place for you printers. Check it out. Uh, and also let you know that Chris has his big event in November from uh, November 3rd to 5th in London this year. So check out ChrisDucker.com. Also, uh, my new book, the number one bestseller with Heather Clancy, Niche Down. Check out NicheDownBook.com. Verve Coffee, the leader in West Coast craft coffee and the official coffee of legends and losers in Santa Cruz, California, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Tokyo, and always at vervecoffee.com. Equity Directory, are you in the startup ecosystem? Are you a startup founder? Are you looking for people who will help you? Are you looking for people who will take the vast majority of their compensation in equity? Then check out equitydirectory.com. A charity we love run by my uh, good buddy, the amazing uh, Tim Rode, who is featured prominently in Niche Down. Check out OneLifeFullyLived.org. This is the nonprofit allowing you to get your arms around your dreams and your plans and turn them into a reality, starting with creating a solid financial future. Uh, I mentioned Nick Cullen in Six Minutes of Legendary. Check out SecondFlightConsultancy.com. This is Nick's, bu Nick's business. He's an incredible growth hacker, and Second Flight Consultancy will help growth hack your business to new heights. The Ziegler Podcast with our good friend Kevin Miller. Check it out. The official sock provider of Legends and Losers, John's Crazy Socks. Uh, you will not find any boring white socks here. Check out johnscrazysocks.com. We got some uh, custom-made Legends and Losers socks uh, they're pink and white and uh, and black. And man, are they ever sexy. And you can uh, get your own custom socks. JohnsCrazySocks.com Another podcast we love, Stop Riding the Pine, with the <laughs> incomparable Jamie J, a guy who's been called the nicest man in podcasting. Check out Stop Riding the Pine. And another charity we love, Kiva. Org. These are micro loans to entrepreneurs all around the world that make a gigantic difference. Check out Kiva.org. All right. We must remind you that this podcast is the sole property of the Legends and Losers Oddcast Network, and we would love it if you shared the shit out of it. All rights do remain disturbed. We must warn you that this podcast was clearly produced in a studio that does contain nuts. We want you to teach entrepreneurship and youpreneurship. Uh, never under uh, underestimate the power of stupid people and groups. Never pour hot coffee on your crotch. Buy only pasture-raised, free-range eggs. Practice diversity. Hey, man, careful. There's a beverage here. Remember, I don't feel tardy. Enjoy Mother Nature. Thank you, Dandy Candy. I love you, Mom and Dad. And hey, Colin, this oddcast really ties the room together, doesn't it? Today, our deepest apologies go out to Marcus Rust, CEO and owner of Roseacre Farms. Sorry, Marcus. We just ran out of time for you. That's it. Thank you so much for investing part of your life with us, and we look forward to seeing you again soon on Legends and Losers. <laughs>